Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. This is not Tuesday. This is Friday. (laughs) If you, if you, if you looked at your calendar, you know that this is Friday. It is the 11th day of Christmas. The 12th day of Christmas. It's January 5th. It's the 12th day of Christmas. Um, yeah, in case that, uh, you didn't know that the 12 days of Christmas are actually from Christmas Day until January 5th and not before Christmas. It is, uh, the Christmas season liturgically within the church. It is the 12 days, uh, counting from December 25th to January 5th. And then, uh, January 6th is Epiphany or Three Kings Day. That is the day that is celebrated, um, the wise men visiting the nativity, visiting the baby Jesus. And then you go into the season of Epiphany. So random trip via to start off our podcast today. These are things that live in my brain and that I then share with you. I'm sure you are just very thrilled to have me randomly drop these bits of information you probably didn't need on into your brain. At any rate, uh, it's Friday and that is because this week, oh my goodness, 2024 is not off to the best start. <laughs> You know how the, the new year comes and you're like, yeah, 2024 or whatever year it is, let's, let's hope it's better than, than last year. And you've got all these hopes and goals and oof, my husband has been sick. Well, first off, we've had uh, internet and power issues at the office, which happens sometimes here, just does. Uh, so that kind of threw off the week. And then my husband, it is January 5th. He has thrown up four out of five days this month, this year. And, uh, yesterday he threw up for about 20 hours. So he's finally feeling better. I'm hoping that that stays and he can keep feeling better and not go back to, uh, the, the previous 20 hours of all of Thursday and most of, and a lot of Thursday into Friday night, early morning, um, Thursday night into Friday morning, cause that was not fun. Well, it wasn't fun for him. I mean, it wasn't fun for me, so it had to have been a million times worse for him, obviously. Um, yeah, not good at all. So let's, let's hope that the second week of 2024 goes a little better, but that's, that's why we're coming to you on Friday instead. I don't know who we are. We, me and the book review podcast. Anyway, why this episode is coming to you on Friday instead of Tuesday. Hey, let's talk about the book we're here to talk about. Um, I am speaking this week with Lynn Squire. We are talking fi- historical fiction. This uh, book is called Immortalized to Death. Uh, the author is Lynn Squire, and this is the first of a trilogy um, involving a character named Dunstan Burnett. The first one, Immortalized to Death, has briefly has Charles Dickens as a character. Uh, it starts with Charles Dickens' death, which you may or may not know anything about Charles Dickens. I actually looked it up because I didn't know what Charles Dickens' cause of death was. Its report was reported as a stroke. But this is a reimagining of what if it wasn't a stroke? What if Charles Dickens was murdered in the middle of writing his uh, mystery novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood? Let me give you the description of the book. Death strikes England's foremost novelist, his latest tale only half told. Was he murdered because someone feared a ruinous revelation, or was it revenge for some past misdeed? Set in the Kent countryside and London slums of 1870, immortalized to death in beds an ingenious solution to Charles Dickens' unfinished The Mystery of Edwin Drood, within the evolving and ultimately tragic consequences of a broader mystery surrounding the author himself. Debut author Lynn Squire kicks off his fascinating Dunstan Burnett trilogy with legendary Victorian novelist Charles Dickens dead at his desk, pen still in hand. 
Convinced that the identity of Dickens' murder lies in the book's missing denouement, Dickens' nephew and unlikely detective, Dunstan Burnett, sets out to complete his uncle's half-finished novel. A stunning revelation crowns this tale about the mysterious death of England's greatest novelist and exposes the author's long-held secret. Now, you may be familiar with Charles Dickens. You may be familiar with with Charles Dickens' books. Many of us had to read A Tale of Two Cities in high school, or maybe you read Dickens in college. I like to listen to A Christmas Carol, listen to or read A Christmas Carol every year in December, as well as watching many versions of it, because there are well, a million, obviously, is hyperbole, but there are what feels like a million different movie versions of A Christmas Carol. But beyond that, I did read A Tale of Two Cities. I have read a couple Dickens novels. I've never read The Mystery of Edwin Drood, which has been speculated on ever since it was unfinished by Charles Dickens. If you are on Book Talk on TikTok, there's been a lot of... There, not a lot. I, I've seen a few videos in the last couple of months talking about Charles Dickens as a person. He wasn't terribly great to his wife, who I think they had 10 children together, and then he left her for another younger woman. You know, same thing happens in every century, every decade. Um, So there's been a lot of sort of spilling the tea on Charles Dickens as a person. But This was interesting to me because it examines his death in a different light and introduces, uh, it's just a different way of examining his life and his work, especially this work, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Let's go ahead and turn to the interview so Lynn can talk about uh, the story and what prompted him to write this reimagining. Again, the book is called Immortalized to Death. The author is Lynn Squire. Hi, Lynn. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to have these opportunities, like uh, speaking to you with, on the Golden State Media uh, concept. I mean, it's a big title that is for me to get up. It is. Got it. But it, I did. I did want to say that this is a a huge plus for aspiring authors to have the opportunity to share something about their books to the well, large audience. I'm I'm very happy to have you here. I am looking forward to talking about your book, Immortalized to Death. But before we do that, if you would take just a few moments to share a little bit about yourself and then my listeners can get to know you a bit. Very good. Well, uh, as you probably guessed from my accent, I grew up in the UK, actually in South Wales, in a small seaside town. And obviously I went to the local grammar school, and during the holidays, I did things like work for the postal service, delivering parcels at Christmas time. Uh, in the summer, I used to work on the beach selling deck chairs. Uh, so some exciting career starts there at the beginning of my, uh, youth. Then I went to study at, uh, university. I went to Cardiff. University, which is my local university. I went to London School of Economics and then to Cambridge uh, before going to the World Bank in Washington, D.C. And when you think about the World Bank, you probably think about, you know, an organization that channels huge loans to developing countries. And it certainly does that. But I was in the research department working as an economist and uh, The one highlight which I would like to mention is that uh, I wrote the report that introduced the poverty line of $1 a day, which has been used by all the UN uh, institutions uh, and still used today. When I left the bank, uh, I became the initial and uh, initial president of the Global Development Network. At the bank, in the research department, we had some of the best researchers, uh, access to data, access to resources. But when I looked around the developing countries, there was nothing, or most countries, there was very little like that, like that capacity to do research which could feed into the policy making for the nation. So the objective of the Global Development Network was to build up research capacity 
in developing countries. So there in a space of 25 years, I went from, from deck chair attendant to president of an international organization. Uh, I now live in Virginia and I live with my wife and my two dogs and my time is spent writing. So I hope that was enough and not too much. No, that's great. And it sounds like you've had a very interesting life. I mean, that's, that's very impressive. You are actually the, I think, third author in the last few months that I've talked to who was originally from Wales. You're kidding. Really? And the other two were both, um, both grew up in Swansea. Oh, I, I can, well, I, I won't try to guess, but that's interesting. Swansea is about, um, 20 miles away from where I grew up. Okay, so very, very close. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think that's amazing coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go ahead and talk about the book. It's the first of a trilogy. It is, um, as I mentioned, called Immortalized to Death. It is a story about Charles Dickens, um, kind of. Well, I'm going to let you I'm going to let you describe it. So can you give an overview of the story? Sure, sure. Um, well, Charles Dickens. uh died on June the 9th in 1870. And he died when he was halfway writing through writing this book called The Mystery of Edwin Drood. So the question which sort of drives my story is this. Did he just die before the novel was completed? Or was he killed to prevent him from finishing the novel? because there was something in there which someone was dreading to hear or to have exposed. Uh, the protagonist in my book, who's called uh, Dunstan Burnett, believes that Dickens was actually poisoned to prevent him from completing the book. So he scours the first half, the completed half of the manuscript, looking for clues about how the rest of the story might continue, and he actually does do quite well. He's a big fan of Charles Dickens, so he knows the author's tendencies, and he's able to figure out what, what to guess what the ending was going to be. And it's a, a chilling prison cell confession. Not only that, he believes he spotted Charles Dickens' killer. However, there's a second murder. This is a the murder of uh, a stage, a London stage actress. And this changes the story, or, or, or at least Dunstan's view of the story, completely. And he realizes now that the confession was not what he thought it was. It's something completely different. It's something about Charles Dickens himself. And he realizes that there's a bigger mystery about Charles Dickens, which he has to solve. So he follows a whole bunch of clues across London and he finally, he thinks, tracks down the guilty party. So this may seem like a a satisfactory outcome, except there's one tiny detail. Dunstan still hasn't come close to the full truth behind the novelist's murder. So there's a final twist and it's not until the last chapter that Dunstan, well, and the reader for that matter, learns who actually put sprickling in Charles Dickens' drinking water. So that's the story. And it's uh, like, I like to say that it's, um, the reader gets the solution to two mysteries. He gets the solution to the mystery of Edwin Drood, and he gets the mystery to this bigger mystery surrounding Charles Dickens himself. So that's, uh, a summary of the novel. You have had an introduction to Lynn. You've had an introduction to the novel. Let's go ahead and take our first break of this episode. When we come back, Lynn will be talking about his inspiration, what prompted him to write this novel. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Lynn Squire about his first book in a trilogy, Immortalized to Death. Let's return to that conversation. Were you a fan of Charles Dickens? Were you a particular fan of The Mystery of Edwin Drood? What was your initial inspiration for deciding to write this story and, and make it make um what has been, you know, they, Charles Dickens supposedly died of a stroke, but you've, you've changed it. Right. Way. So what was your initial inspiration? Well, I, I, I'll tell you. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I'm really not exactly uh, a big fan of Charles Dickens. Um, obviously, he wrote some wonderful stories and, uh, you know, introduced some marvelous characters, but I actually find his stories a little bit long-winded and you know very wordy. Uh, I prefer some of his shorter stories like Oliver Twist or The Tale of Two, Two Cities. And I think the reason why I'm not such a big fan of Dickens is because he let the characters drive his stories, uh, whereas I like the plot to have the plot drive the story. Uh, if you think of his first big uh, literary breakthrough, the Pickwick Papers, that was just about uh, the members of this club, the Pickwick Club, who went galloping around the countryside and they ran into all sorts of adventures or misadventures, I should say. But there was no storyline that was being laid out in advance and was running through this series of adventures. It was just whatever happened to these characters. And while he did introduce some... Uh, more plotting later in his stories that the characters always were an important driving force for, for him. So, you know, I, I mean, I admire his writing greatly, but if I was reaching for a book to read this evening, it probably would not be a Charles Dickens book. Uh, so that, that was my comment on Charles Dickens. But you asked, the question you asked was, what was the inspiration or, or how did I, I guess, how did I come to, to write this? And the answer to that is it's, it's really serendipity. Um, let me just say a word about the, the mystery of Edwin Drew itself. Now I'll explain what I mean by serendipity. Uh, in the in the mystery of Edwin Drew, as I said, uh, Dickens died halfway through, so we never know exactly what happened. But it's leading the reader to believe that. Uh, John Jasper, who is the sinister choir master of Cloisterham Cathedral, is going to strangle Edwin Drood of the title because Edwin is the fiance of Rosa Bud and Jasper has this mad obsession with Rosa. And it looks as though um, Jasper is going to dump Edwin's body in one of the tombs in the cathedral grounds. But unbeknownst to him, uh, there's a ruby and diamond ring in Edwin's pocket. So he douses the body with quicklime. But of course, the jewels and the ring survive that. That leads to the identification of Edwin's body and eventually Jasper's capture. So that's the, the story. Uh, now that last part about, well, sorry, let me, let's just say, Edwin does disappear, but we don't know for sure whether 
Jasper has murdered him, and we don't know how if Jasper is captured if he did murder him, uh, because Dickens died. So that though has not stopped a tremendous amount of speculation about how the story was supposed to, was supposed to continue. And in the number in the last uh, when was it, like 150 years since he died, the number of um, attempts to discover the true ending is really mind-boggling. There was a 600-page bibliography which was published in 1998, which lists almost 2,000 articles and books seeking to unearth clues about Edwin's fate and how the plot might evolve. And this was not just uh, an interest among Dickensian scholars. Uh, You may remember P.B. PBS Masterpiece Production, uh, which featured uh, Matthew Rees. Mm-hmm. He, he was John Jasper. Uh, you may remember a Broadway musical. And in the musical, the audience at the intermission was asked to suggest the ending for the story. Then the actors would play it out. And then, uh, most surprising of all, there was actually a, a mock trial of Edwin Drood for the murder of, uh, excuse me, of John Jasper for the murder of Edwin Drood, which was held in uh, King's Hall in, in Covent Garden. And the jury was under the foremanship of George Bernard Shaw. So these are you know famous people that were involved. And they returned a rather spineless verdict of manslaughter. And at this point, the judge, who is none other than G.K., Chesterton, who is the author of the famous Father Brown series, he probably fined everyone except himself for contempt of court. So there's been this massive amount of interest in the uh, in the conclusion to this story. So my inspiration is that when I read the book, I was rereading some of the classics, and The Mystery of Edwin Drood was one of the ones I was rereading. I discovered what I thought was a clue or if you like a a, a flaw in, in the plot which no one else had seemed to spot. I am not a novelist at, at, at that point. I've never written anything like a book, not a novelist of any sort, but I've got this clue which seems to escape the attention of everyone else. Uh, and we can talk about the clue uh, in, in a minute if, if you like. But uh, I thought, well, can this possibly be that I found it and nobody else saw saw it? I submit the clue written up as a two-page note to a journal, which is actually published by the University of Kent, called the Dickensia, which, as you can guess, is all about Dickens. And it was reviewed and it was accepted for publication. So in a way, it received the blessing and it, as a an original contribution to the debate about the mystery of Edwin Drood. So I had this clue, which seemed to have some merit. I had no thought of writing a book or a novel until I started reading more about Dickens' life. He actually had a very dark side to him. Uh, When he was just turning 40, he fell madly in love with a 20-year-old London stage actress. Within a year of that, he had separated from his wife uh, after she'd given him 10 children. And while he never lived with uh, his mistress, it was obvious that they, from there on, they were a pair. So there was even a rumour that he and the stage actress father uh, sired a, a child. So here, this was, I thought, was this is fertile ground for having a broader story. And it was from this that I developed a bigger mystery surrounding Dickens himself. So as you see, it's, um, as I say, it was never any thought of being a novelist, but I found this clue and that gradually developed into a, a full-blown novel. 
Well, it is it is very interesting that um, Dickens did not write mysteries typically. And so the fact that he died in the midst of writing this mystery, creating an even bigger mystery, which then prompted you to write a mystery. About yeah, it. I think you've got it. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's a it's a nice chain of events. Um, so Dunstan is the protagonist here. He's trying to solve this m- murder. Uh, what he, you know, what they have decided is a murder. Can you talk a little bit more about him? And what do you think readers? Wh- how do you think he'll resonate with readers? Well, um, I actually read mystery books a lot. I've always read mystery books. Uh, I actually do reviews for City Book Review, which is uh, based in Sacramento. Sacramento, I always review mysteries. So I've read a a whole load of mysteries. And I was looking for a a protagonist who did not follow sort of the typical pattern of detectives that you see in 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 fiction. So I didn't want someone like Sherlock Holmes. I think Sherlock Holmes is a terrific character and the stories are great. But he... um, uses his powers of observation to draw conclusions and deductions, which they're they're very clever. They need not always be right. There may be alternative explanations for what he's observed, but in the stories, they are always 100% correct. So, you know, it's, it's kind of odd or... It's almost unfair that you've got this really, really clever guy. He's doing, looking at all these clues and, and making all these observations. And he arrives at the one solution, which is well, consistent with what he's observed, is not by any means the only possibility. So I don't want to stay away from that. At the same time, I didn't want the sort of the hard nosed, tough guy. Detective, like say Sam Spade. Uh, in some of these stories you read that Sam Spade types get absolutely beaten up in one chapter. And then the next, they're back on their feet, ready to go, and you'd never known they'd been in a fight. Uh, and I, so again, I, I wanted to stay away from that. So as I settled on a diffident middle-aged retired bookkeeper, and if you want, um, uh, a mental image of him and keeping with our Dickens theme, think of Mr. Pickwick. So like a round, podgy figure, very weak, uncertain, uh, wavering. And that's, that would be a good image of, um, Dunstan Burnett. So he's not, he doesn't look like detective material in short. However, he does have, two sleuthing talents. Obviously, he's going to be trying to solve these crimes, so he has to have some talents in that department. And one is that he has this uh, uncanny ability to join dots in a new way. And what's more peculiar to him is that he even conjures up as yet unseen dots to create uh, a picture of a crime which is invisible to everyone else. Now here, here, there's a difference from Sherlock, because unlike Sherlock's always correct deductions, Dunstan's preductions, as his uh, policeman friend calls them, can clearly be absolutely wrong, and they often are. But on the odd occasion when they are right, they can be breathtakingly so. So he does have this uh, capacity and he can be he doesn't have the courage he's not blessed with courage and strength like some of the um Sam Spade type detectives but he can be determinedly stubborn and once he does get his teeth into something he has the perseverance of King Bruce's spider so th- the tension in the story and uh, it's the reason why I like Dunstan. The tension in the story is whether this diffident retired bookkeeper with his two very limited skills, just this uh, these productions and his perseverance, 
whether he is ever going to be able to solve the mysteries which appear almost unsolvable with which he is uh, confronted. So that's a little bit about uh, Dunstan. And uh, the, my, the way I started uh, writing was I had the plot first and then I developed Dunstan subsequently. But now Dunstan has become such an important part that he will be what carries forward into the next two books of the trilogy. Yeah, and he's not, he's not, um, I wouldn't call him bumbling, but he's not this sort of suave, sophisticated, tough, you know, everything that you sometimes expect from a detective in a book like this. He's kind of a normal person and he's stumbled into this case that now he's determined to solve. Exactly. It's time for our second break of this episode, but I actually like a balance. Sometimes I like a detective or um, a person trying to solve a mystery to really have everything together, to know, you know, they kind of get everything right, they've got good instincts, and then sometimes I like them to be a little bit more like I would be, and just kind of figuring things out as they go along, maybe stumbling into some answers, you know, kind of a combination of stumbling into answers and, and really good, solid detective work and logic. I'd definitely be more of a stumbler. They're solid detective work and logic. Probably not my strong suits, but um, I'll think about that while we take this next break. When we come back, we'll be talking about research and that clue that Lynn found in reading The Mystery of Edwin Drood that prompted the writing of this novel. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. As you know, I'm speaking today with Lynn Squire about his book, Immortalized to Death. Let's return to that conversation with Lynn. Yeah. You mentioned the clue that started this whole Uh, journey that you were reading. I would imagine you had to do, uh, and we can talk about the clue, um, if you want to start with the clue, but then also how much research did you need to do to write the book? Okay, let me deal with the clue just just quickly then. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about it, but only if you promise not to tell anyone else, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So um, it, it has to do with this engagement ring, this uh, diamond and ruby ring. It uh, looks as though it's going to be found on Edwin's body, or Edwin's decomposed body in the, in the tomb, and that leads to his identification and Jasper's capture. Okay, fine. But uh, Edwin actually places this ring in his waistcoat pocket several days before he's supposed to be dumped in in the tomb. Uh, He actually uh, separates from uh, his fiancée, Rosa, and uh, places the ring in his pocket. It just seemed to be extremely odd that he would keep this very expensive ring. It's expensive in terms of sentiment and value. He'd keep it in his waistcoat pocket for several days. He'd be much more likely to put it somewhere safe in his lodgings. So, if it's not in his pocket when he's dumped in the tomb, 
then the ring cannot be the means of identification of Edwin's body, nor of the means of the capture of Jasper. So this one small change, in the, especially the change in the location of the diamond, of the ruby and diamond ring, opens up a whole raft of new possible solutions. Uh, so that was the, the clue. And what was the second part? Oh, background, right? Uh, you wanted to hear a little bit so about from there, from there you you decided you had this clue uh, that you would have needed to research and then research further to write the novel yeah um the the clue that was the clue that i sent to the the Keynesian publication for you know start to try to get their uh approval really that this was a genuine uh, contribution to the debate about the ending to the mystery of Edwin Drood. Uh, once I decided that I was going to write a book, I did think very carefully about the research that had to be done. I've been a researcher all my life um, in, in economics, but the spirit of a researcher is there. So I, I began by looking at information about 19th century England. You know, the book is set in Victorian England, and what I wanted to make sure was that I didn't write things which would, which, uh, which would make the reader react and say, oh, well, that's not right. That wasn't like, it wasn't like that in Victorian England. I didn't want anything jarring like that because if it happens once, maybe it's okay. But if it happens several times, the reader's going to be turned off and maybe not read the book. So. Uh, I researched uh, Victorian dress, furniture, architecture, and so on, all at a, at a general level. And most of this, of course, can be just be done online. And what I wanted to do was to make sure I had enough feel for the time and the place so that I could write something which the reader would find acceptable. Uh, let me see if I can explain that a little bit. Imagine I'm writing a scene about a man sitting in a French cafe drinking an aperitif. I don't have to base that on a real French cafe. All I have to do is be, give the flavor of a man being in a French cafe and hope that the reader says, oh yeah, that's a French cafe, all right. And that's what I thought was important in this first round of research, to make sure that everything was believable as far as scene setting and general background was concerned. But there's a lot more research that has to be done because my story is about a very, very famous man. Everyone knows about something about Charles Dickens and some people know a whole lot about him. So now I have to be extra careful to make sure I have it exactly right so that people are not confronted with, you know, this this jarring situation where they think, oh, well, that's not the Charles Dickens I know, or he didn't live here, or he didn't do that or the other. So uh, I started by reading several bibliographies, including the one by John Foster. Uh, John Foster was uh, Dickens' literary agent and a very close friend of he wrote the first and probably the most important biography of, of Dickens. It's a 900-page monster, but it's very comprehensive. I also read biographies of some of the smaller, uh, the secondary characters in the book, including Georgina Hogarth, who was his sister-in-law and uh, hostess at, for, uh, at his house in Gans Hill Place in Kent. And uh, a, a biography of Alan Turnan, who is the London stage actress that Dickens fell for. Uh, and I did read most of his novels. I'd read them earlier. Uh, I reread them. And I don't think this is a requirement for most authors. But I wanted to make sure that when Dunstan Burnett, Burnett my protagonist, wrote his continuation of the mystery of Edwin Drood, he stayed true to the literary tendencies of uh, Dickens himself. And there's certainly some which which stand out. Uh, I can talk about those later if you want, but let me move on for a minute. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, the last thing I did was uh, physical 
actual physical research. Uh, I visited Gadshill Place, uh, which is Dickens' home in Kent. It's about uh, an hour's train ride from central London. And the house is very much as it was in Dickens' day. I actually stood in the study where the murder in my novel is, is supposedly is supposedly takes place. I also walked across the Gravesend Road to the pub on the other side. I had a pint and a pie there. This is the false stuff in, and that's a scene of another incident in in my book. So after that, it was just a short day trip. I felt I had uh, enough knowledge about the author's home that I could present it in a way which would be acceptable to most readers, even those who who toured Gansel Place themselves. So that was research, sort of background, then more detailed stuff on Dickens himself, and then actually visiting where he lived and, well, where he did actually die there as well. Another thing about historical fiction in term, you know, besides there's always a lot of research, uh, for places and, and events, um, right. the character development, I think, is a little bit different when you're writing historical fiction because you have both fictional characters and characters who are based on real people. So can you talk a little bit about, um, how you went about character development, fictional versus non-fictional, um, characters? Yeah. Um, but first, let me say that uh, although the book, it, this book is obviously about Dickens, he only features uh, in the story in the first chapter where he's he's found dead in his study. So uh, I didn't really have to spend a lot of time on Dickens' character, but everything about him, his writing, where he lived and so on and so forth had to be true. The characters where I spent more time were the two uh, secondary characters, both ladies, G- Georgina Hogarth, and who is his hostess and sister-in-law, and uh, Ellen Turner, who is, I think, a fascinating person. I mean, she's a real person. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful book called about her called The Invisible Woman, uh, I spend a lot of time studying her because while she's important in my story, she was not really known widely in real life. And the liaisons between Dickens and Ellen Turner was kept secret for almost 60 years. It only appeared much, much later. So she's a fascinating character. So I did devote time for both of those who are real um, real people. I've talked about Dunstan Burnett. Burnett. That's where I put my main emphasis in, in um, figuring out a character uh, who's going to be the main protagonist of the of the story. The other one, which uh, in a way serves to, as a counterpoint to Dunstan, is the police inspector in the story. Dunstan has this tendency to, you know, to see these, to connect the dots and do this imaginary stuff and arrive at a conclusion which could or could, which could be right or could be wrong. The inspector, the police inspector is the exact opposite. He is facts first, facts last, facts only kind of man. So, uh, I make a lot of the play between these two characters. And uh, the police officer, like Dunstan, will appear in the in the next story as well. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and you, you've mentioned the next story. This is the first of a trilogy. What can you say about the next either book or the next two books without giving, of course, too much away? Right. Um, well, the the second book is actually already finished, and uh, it's called Fatally Inferior, and will should come out in September of, well, next year, <laughs> 24. And uh, this is a story of, of revenge. And it's set against the 
uh, the furor that arose in the United Kingdom when Darwin, Charles Darwin, introduced his theory of evolution. Uh, this was a, the, it, what followed was really a battle for the minds and souls of people. There was the traditional uh, religionists on the one side versus the uh, sort of the emerging band of empirical researchers on the other side. So you had the uh, religion versus science kind of kind of problem. And uh, what happens in this story is that uh, a young woman is apparently abducted from a house. And the house is completely locked. You can't get in or can't get out. But somehow, the woman goes to bed one night. Next morning, she's gone. So it's, in a way, a a reverse of the locked door mystery. It's not where uh, the murderers somehow come in, kill the person, and disappear. And apparently, it's impossible for him to have done that. This is the body disappears. And uh, in the story, uh, Dunstan Burnett actually figures out the motive behind the uh, disappearance of the woman. But it's a long, long time before he finally gets to the real answer of what happened to her, why she disappeared. And uh, in fact, he, he doesn't really answer all the questions uh, until there's, uh, well, let me not <laughs> say the until bit because that's too revealing. Right. But that's, basically, that's, that's basically the story in, in Fatally Inferior. And the third, which uh, is in progress as we speak, is called the seance of murder. That's a little play on science, in case you didn't get it. But uh, this is going to be forthcoming in September 2025. Uh, This story is about greed. And it's set against, as you might have guessed, the spiritualist movement that swept through Victorian England, well, and the US as well, in uh, the late 19th century. And here, the uh, the issue for Dunstan is a little more dire because he has to expose the murderer to the heir of the Crenshaw baronetcy before he himself dies. So uh, that's the... The third story, I'm about uh, two-thirds of the way through that, as it's my uh, <laughs> usual procedure. The plot is worked out all the way to the end, and uh, I already have some of the characters because they're carries up carryovers from the um, previous stories. But, um, well, there will be some new characters as well. Sure, yeah, makes sense. Let's go ahead and take our final break of this episode. When we come back, advice from Lynn for aspiring authors. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Lynn Squire. You came 
at writing from a, a little bit of a different perspective because it you know it wasn't something that you'd necessarily always had planned on doing writing for publication it came from a very specific set of circumstances exactly um, from your experience then what advice would you give to someone who suddenly thinks hey you know what maybe i do want to write a novel <laughs> yeah well i i don't know quite what to say cuz i don't want to be sound too negative but um that well let me make, let me make two points one is that it it is hard work and uh, you know as an author you're often sitting there writing you know by yourself so it's a, it's, for a lot of the time it's it's quite a lonely uh, exercise and uh, it can be very frustrating you know you have blocks and so on and so forth uh i personally I'm not a fast writer, so it takes me a lot of time. I tend to think about the book even when I'm not writing, so I'll have ideas in the middle of the night or whatever and come back and write. But writing it, it I think a lot of people, and me especially, find it, it's, it's hard going. It's not that I don't enjoy it, but there is this difficulty uh, to it. Now that's only the first step. Say you finish your book, then you've got to get a publisher, which uh, is frankly extraordinarily difficult and probably getting tougher and tougher, uh, you know, with books online. So getting a traditional publisher is not easy. And then there's marketing. And all I can say on that is thank goodness for podcasts like you, which <laughs> are really, really helpful. So the first point is that, you know, this can be a difficult process. It can have lots of um, rewards at the end, but it's a difficult process. Second point I wanted to make is that uh, what is the point of writing a book? Well, presumably you want something which will interest the reader or entertain the reader. So it could be something intellectual and makes them think, or it could be entertainment and gives them enjoyment. But it has to be in the writer's mind all the time. Will my reader get something out of this book? So if I put my two points together, you know, the, the difficulty of the process and the need to have something which readers are going to enjoy, it leads me to this piece of advice. It is, if you want to write, if you want to write a book, make sure you have something which you really, really want to tell the reader and which you think the reader will really, really find interesting. If you don't have that, um, well, I'm not sure it's worth it. And you were worried that that would be too negative, but no, I think it's just the reality of writing. <laughs> People don't often think about the, the hours that maybe go into it or, you know, the struggles right. that are involved. Yeah. You have mentioned that you... um you do read mysteries, you write within the historical fiction genre. Um, so when you are reading just for you, not necessarily for research or anything else, who are your favorite um, authors or maybe your favorite genres? Well, uh, this will probably come as no surprise, uh, but I basically read mysteries most of the time. Uh, I do read some nonfiction, but uh, as I was saying before, you know, if I'm going to look for a book for the to read in the evening, I would pick a mystery. And uh, my, my favorites go all the way back to the, you know, golden age of mysteries of Agatha Christie and, and so on. But if I had to think of some more recent authors, I would say, um, think of In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, which was, um, it's what, it, at the time when it came out, people called it a, a nonfiction novel because it's really very much fact-based, and I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I like uh, The Angel of Darkness. That would be another of my favorites by Caleb Carr. He's the author of The Alienist, which was the, perhaps the first and perhaps better-known book, but I like the second one more. Uh, but my real favorite book that I've read uh, in the last few years is... Um, the Pale Blue Eye by Louis Bayard. 
And this is a really intriguing story of revenge. And it has a truly inventive twist in the tale. It's set in uh, West Point. Uh, It features a retired police detective called Gus Lander. But it also uh, in the story is a young cadet by the name of Edgar Allan Poe. This is before he published his books, but um, it is the Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, I enjoyed this so much. And if there's one book that I really, really wish I'd written, it would be The Pale Blue Eye. I thought it was terrific. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. If people want to know um, more about the books or maybe uh, you a little bit, what is your online presence? Can you share a website or any social media that you're active on? Yeah, um, I, I, I do have a website. It's called Lynn Squire Mysteries. That's all written as one word, dot com. And uh, so there's stuff about me on there. Uh, there's stuff about the trilogy on there. But and this may be of <laughs> more interest to to re, uh, to viewers. I have um, a section where I present my picks of the month. So I offer what I think are the best stories that have come out that month. I review them and explain why I, I like them and why I think they're worth reading. Uh, and then apart from that, I'm on... Uh, yeah, my email is uh, linsquire at uh, yahoo.com. And my social media is conducted through uh, a, my publicist. I am not uh, an active user of social media. It's all done through my, personally, it's all done through my publicist. All right. Well, thank you for that information. Um, Lynn, is there anything that we have not covered in this time together that you were hoping to highlight about the the books or writing? Uh, I I must say, I think this has been, you know, the questions really gave me an opportunity to tell you most of what I wanted to say. Questions were very comprehensive. So uh, let me just uh, perhaps uh, repeat, if, if you like, but let me just say that uh, you probably have no idea how much authors like I appreciate your podcasts. So let me once again just say thank you very, very much. And I will look forward to hearing uh, what we've just <laughs> talked about on Tuesday. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk not only about the first book, but a little bit about the second and third books as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you once again for Lynn, to Lynn, to Lynn for joining me for this episode to talk about what is now the first of a trilogy featuring Dunstan Burnett as that main character. You know, I am a huge fan of historical fiction and I like historical fiction that, that leans a little heavier on that fiction part sometimes where you can reimagine something in a way, just to shine a different light on the historical person or the time period, etc. And, you know, just maybe have a little fun with, with that historical person, with that time period. Of course, now, do not go telling people that Charles Dickens was murdered. (laughs) It's historical fiction. Just remember the fiction part. I know you're all much smarter than that. I'm just being silly, but yeah, um, don't, don't put that in a, don't put that in a, in a school report and say, no, really, I, I read a book where it said Charles Dickens was murdered. <laughs> it wasn't a stroke, but you could try it. I just don't recommend it. So thank you to Lynn. If you are a fan of historical fiction, if you are a fan of Charles Dickens, if you are maybe, um, someone who has been interested in the mystery of Edwin Drood and the fact that it is still a mystery, how it was supposed to end, then this is a book that you definitely want to check out. I'm interested to see how Dunstan evolves as a character, where his next mysteries take him as he goes a little bit further away from this centralized 
mystery of Charles Dickens' death. He's involved in other mysteries. So you have, you, we, the readers, have that to look forward to as the other two books come out um, this year and then again next year. If you are a fan, like I said, you should definitely check out this book. Or if you have a historical fiction and or Charles Dickens fan in your life, then they may want to read this as well. And you can gift it or recommend it to them. Thank you again to Lynn. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners, for joining me for this episode. I hope you'll join me for the next episode. We're sticking with historical fiction, but this time it is... um, leaning more on the historical less than the fiction we're we're talking again about another author of a beloved series the book is called after Anne, the author is Logan Steiner. Uh, after Anne, Anne with an E. Uh, yes, we are talking about Lucy Maud Montgomery or L. M. Montgomery, the author of the Anne of Green Gables series, and looking at her life and um, well, looking at her life as the author of that series. So I'm looking forward to speaking to Logan about that, and I hope you will join me for that episode next week. As always, if you are a fan of this podcast and have not already done so, could you please like, subscribe, follow on the platform on which you are listening to the podcast? That way, even when episodes come out on Friday instead of Tuesday, you will know when those episodes come out because you will be notified about those episodes. This also helps to get the episode out or the podcast out to more listeners. Also, leaving a review is incredibly helpful in helping to get the podcast out to more listeners. If you have not done so already and could leave a review, starred or written, doesn't have to be complicated. I appreciate any and all feedback that I get on the podcast. Finally, you can follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram. You can find the podcast and of course, by extension, me at all of those places. And I love hearing from you. Let me know how your holidays were. Let me know how your 2024 is going. I hope it started out a little better than, than ours has. Um, let me know what you're planning on reading. Ooh, what are your 2024 reading goals? Did you make your 2023 reading goals? I was going to do a wrap-up episode, but then life happened. I read 147 books in 2023. That is the most since I started keeping track that I have ever read, and it is amazing. It's partly to do with my husband going back home to Ohio and being gone for five weeks and me just working, working, working and listening to audiobooks all day. <laughs> yes, audiobooks are reading. We're not going to, we're not going to have the debate, debate right now. But, um, yeah, pretty proud of myself on that. Read some really great books for the podcast last year and, um, found some new authors through audiobooks. Just every year of reading is a good year. That's, regardless of, you know, some of the ones that you read that maybe aren't top of your list. I read and I found new authors and I discovered new books that I enjoyed and new books that I loved. And that is a win in my book. Um, so yeah, find me on social media, find the podcast on social media. Let me know. Did you hit your goals? Even if you didn't hit your goals, it's okay, as long as you read. Um, and what are your goals for 2024 in terms of reading? Hope you're having I was going to say a great week. I hope you had a great week. It's already Friday, and I hope that you are doing something wonderful this weekend, whatever that wonderful might entail. Of course, as always, I hope it involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a great book. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.